In this video, I'm going to talk about the von Neumann impossibility theorem. And so what von Neumann is trying to show with this theorem is that a hidden variable theory of quantum mechanics is impossible. And it's widely believed now that he failed in this. Although some people apparently still appeal to von Neumann's impossibility theorem when trying to show that there is no possible way to have a hidden variables theorem or theory of quantum mechanics. And so, like with a lot of things done with math, what this impossibility theorem is saying is something somewhat simple, but it's kind of done in a way that can seem kind of obfuscating. And so I'm going to try and, you know, go through some of the ways people have discussed this, but I'm also going to try to keep it uh, simple. And at the end of the video, I'm going to give, you know, kind of the take home message here. But anyway, so what this comes down to is that hidden variables theories must contain what are called dispersion free states. So dispersion is essentially variance and is illustrated by the fact that two non-commuting observables can be expressed as superpositions of each other. And so if we have this right here, this observable, or this state rather, psi, it's a superposition of these phi states here. So the psi is represented in the phi basis, and so when measuring an observable O of psi in the phi basis, the variance of O is not zero. By changing bases, we can also show that, uh, so now we're going to the psi basis and measuring O uh, in phi here, and we see that the variance is also not zero. So if we want a more pictorial view of this, uh, what we can say is, say we have this right here, which is our, our uh, quantum state here in the z direction, and we're looking at it in the x basis. And so if it's dispersion free, what we see is something that looks like this, where it's essentially an equal amount of things that are pointing uh, in this image right in the x direction and left in the x direction. But these states in these directions have definite values in these. And so each one of these is has no dispersion in itself because it is actually pointing in a particular direction. And so if we just take one of these, say, pointing in the right direction, and we want to look at the ensemble of that, it looks like just a bunch of these actually pointing in the rightward direction. But what dispersion means is that if we have this in the z direction, then it's made out of a bunch of these states in the sort of left-right superposition direction in our x basis. Then if we take each one of these and look at this, it is also a superposition of all of these up and down in the z direction. And so these things are, you know, made out of superpositions of each other. And so what they call this is, uh, is uh, homogeneous. So these are homogeneous because each one of these in this uh, in this ensemble here is exactly the same as all of the other ones and each of these are the same like this because they are the same like this in all of the other ones and so they are sort of superpositions of each other and so if we look up here what we see is we have some pointing right some pointing left and so that's not homogeneous because we have different things going on where here this is saying that uh, the dispersive ensemble is homogeneous. So in hidden variables theories, however, the dispersion of a physical quantity in the psi ensemble is seen as due to the mixing of several pure, so dispersion-free phi ensembles. And so that's kind of what I'm trying to show up here is that this Z in the up-down sort of superposition is made out of sort of an ensemble of, uh, you know, equal parts of the right pointing and the left pointing in the X direction here. And so these are each dispersion free right here. Similarly, the dispersion in a pure phi ensemble results from a mixing of different psi ensembles. Hence, the hidden variable theories assert the notional division of the entire ensemble into dispersion-free ensembles, 
each of which has no dispersion in any of the observables. And so they're saying that it, there is dispersion, say, in this one, uh, you know, this looks like a superposition, but the in the X direction right here, these are all non-dispersive states right here. And so hence the hidden variable theories assert the notional division of the entire ensemble into dispersion-free ensembles, each of which has no dispersion in any of the observables. This also means that the psi state is not a superposition of the uh, phi states. And so it's not really a superposition of these the way it is down here. So it's not superpositions of each of these. These are in definite states here. So it's not actually a superposition of it. This absence of superposition in a hidden variable theory, and hence the absence of the concept of wave-particle duality that defines quantum mechanics, is the crucial conceptual difference to be noted. A hidden variable theory tries to match the measured dispersion in the given state psi to what is predicted by quantum mechanics by distributing the measured values among the different dispersion-free sets. So that's what I mean here about... Uh, how there's sort of an equal amount of both of these. And that's why if you have something like this and you measure it in, you know, the X direction that uh, it will look like you are getting sort of a probability distribution. That's just, But that's just because there is an equal number of, you know, the right pointing and the left pointing ones here. So each measurement results in a specific value among the many possible values randomly because of the hidden variables taking a random unknown realization. So again, each of these is sort of randomly distributed. Each single one has a definite value, but the ensemble of it is, is sort of randomly distributed. Uh, which, uh, so the hidden variable is taking a random unknown realization, which then picks one among the many dispersion-free ensembles. I want to emphasize the point that the characteristic feature of a hidden variable theory is the existence of dispersion-free ensembles, and not merely the, merely the labeling of some unmeasured physical observables as hidden variables. And so what von Neumann here is going to do, and so he did this in his... 1932 work on the foundations of quantum mechanics. So he essentially gives five postulates. Some people put it at four, some at five. I think uh, von Neumann didn't actually sort of enumerate these this way. And so some people kind of, uh, you know, well, some people, as we'll see here in a little bit, actually put at, at four different postulates, but we can think of it as five as well without you know, sort of losing the meaning here. And so we have that postulate one. So if a quantity, so observable, is represented by the operator R, then a function F of this quantity is represented by this right here. So it's a function on that operator. And so that function will bring it to uh, an actual value, like, you know, just a number. So if quantities are represented by the operators R, S, and so on, then the sum of these quantities is represented by uh, the operator here. So we can just add those up and we get a uh, another operator from the addition of them. And so von Neumann says this is regardless of whether the operators commute or not. And I have that bolded there because that's obviously going to be important here for showing why von Neumann is actually wrong here. And I mean, if you know anything about like the... Uh, uncertainty principles, then you you can probably already somewhat guess what's going to be wrong here. So the correspondence between her mission operators and observables is one to one. This is the uh, postulate here that is sometimes sort of left out. Uh, I think it's one of those things that kind of goes unstated that this is a, an injective function here. And we'll actually talk about that. I think uh, more in the next video when I go through the uh, Koken Specker, uh, the Koken Specker theorem. But this is often taken as almost sort of an unstated assumption here. So if the quantity R is by nature non negative, then its expectation value is non negative. Then I have here in red with this here in bold, because this is kind of the one here that everybody sort of shows is 
not really a postulate. It's not, it's not a good assumption that von Neumann could have made. And so it says that if R, S, and so on are arbitrary quantities and A, B, so on are real numbers, then the expectation value of the sum is equal to the sum of the expectation values, regardless of whether the operators commute or not. And so from this, von Neumann gives a proof for the impossibility of hidden variables in quantum mechanics. So I will paraphrase the proof here. This is given by this paper right here. And again, all these references and everything will be found in the lecture notes, which are linked to in the description down below. So if you want to read my references more on your own, you can go ahead and do that uh, because I'm just giving kind of a summary of the main highlights of all these things here. And so this paper says the form of the argument starts with a statement. So this is the statement S1. If there are hidden variables, then no dispersive ensemble is homogeneous. And so essentially it's saying that if we have hidden variables, then it has to look like this one, where the hidden variables here would be, you know, essentially the fact that this actually is pointing right, this actually is pointing left. Those are hidden from us by the fact that this is an ensemble, and so we will get, you know, a probabilistic or a statistical result from multiple experiments. But uh, this right here, this statement is essentially saying if there are hidden variables, then no dispersive ensemble is homogeneous. So it's saying if we do have hidden variables, then we could not have these bottom two here, which are the uh, homogeneous dispersion states for these. To understand this, we remind ourselves that an ensemble, which is a group of systems, is dispersive if the values of observables are not definite, but conceivable only within a certain probability distribution. So uh, again, dispersive, like I said, is means that these are actually sort of, you know, the sort of states in the ensemble are themselves in superpositions rather than in actual uh, in actual states there. In von Neumann's mathematical terminology, an ensemble is dispersion free if and only if for all operators. So again, even non-commuting ones uh, are, we get that the expectation value of R squared minus the square of the expectation value is zero, meaning that these two things are equal to each other. So an ensemble is homogeneous if its, actual, if its statistical behavior is the same as that of any of its sub-ensembles. So again, we look back up here. This has a 50-50 chance, and each of its sort of sub-ensembles in here is also 50-50. And so that's what it means by being homogeneous. In mathematical terms, for ensemble E, whose sub-ensembles are E1 and E2, uh, if the expectation value of R in uh, here is equal to the expectation value of E1 and the expectation value of R in E2, uh, where A is and B are both greater than zero and come out equal to one when added together, then it's saying that the expectation value here of R is equal to the expectation value of R in E1, which is also equal to the expectation value of R in E2. Now statement S1 is the case because if we have dispersion and we have also the right hidden variables, then the dispersion is explained by some states or sub-ensembles of states having different values for these variables. This entails that the ensemble cannot be such that all of its sub-ensembles are statistically alike. And we can see that up here, you know, this one right here actually pointing right is not statistically the same as this one actually pointing left here, but uh, if we have dispersion, then each of these are statistically exactly alike each other. So in other words, the ensemble will not be homogeneous. And so the paper says von Neumann showed that every ensemble is dispersive, or you know, von Neumann thinks, I guess, that he showed that every ensemble is dispersive and homogeneous ensembles do exist. Uh, in fact, von Neumann showed that ordinary quantum mechanics states describe homogeneous states. Hence, from S1, there can be no hidden variables. 
And so I'm going to kind of uh, go through the same sort of uh, argument here, the same sort of, I guess, proof that I just talked about. And, you know, this is just to kind of get, I guess, kind of a Rashomon effect of, you know, what people have said about this proof. And then I will go through the reasons why people think that the proof fails. So Merman and Schack, uh, in this 2018 paper, put the argument a little differently. They attribute to von Neumann four assumptions. Like I said, some people put it at five, some at four, and they give them this way. So the bold here is added by me. So they call it assumption A prime, and this is just the page in von Neumann's book in which they are pulling these. There exists an expectation function, which they put as uh, EXP here, from physical quantities to real numbers. So that's just those uh, those functions that I was talking about before. That's a, that takes the the uh, operator as an argument and gives out an actual number. So assumption B prime here, which is the one that they're going to criticize, is pretty much just saying the same thing as what the red one from above is is saying. So if RS are arbitrary physical quantities, not necessarily simultaneously measurable, and so again, non-commutable, so again, if you can maybe see that this thing about the uncertainty principle is going to come into play here. Uh, for why von Neumann is wrong. And so A and B are real numbers, and the expectation function is linear. So, like I said, that's the same as what we we're showing up here in red. Uh, so that's the one that they're going to that they're going to criticize here. So then they also have assumption one. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the physical quantities and Hermitian operators that act on Hilbert space for any real valued function f. If the quantity r has the operator r, then the quantity uh, has the operator here. Uh, so assumption two, and I'm going through these fast because they're not really going to be important for our purposes here. So if the physical quantities r, s, and so on have Hermitian operators r, s, and so on, then the physical quantity has the Hermitian operator uh, whether or not R, S are simultaneously measurable. So I guess I could put that in bold here as, you know, kind of uh, part of that thing that they're going to criticize here. So then the authors say that if all of von Neumann's postulates are correct, then the expectation value for an ensemble of experiments must have this form. And so this is the form that you often see in a lot of these papers talking about this. And so I'm actually going to take a little side detour here to actually explain what this means right here. So uh, some background here. So this rho here, this Greek letter rho, is often used to represent the density matrix, but the paper that I'm quoting from here actually uses U, which I guess is not uncommon because it's just saying that it's a unitary operator. Uh, and R is the Hermitian operator. So R here is the Hermitian operator. Rho is our density matrix. Uh, and so that the R is the Hermitian operator corresponding to the physical quantity R here, which this is the expectation value of that R. So a density matrix, what that is, it's something, it's a matrix that is generated by taking the outer product of the basis for that observable. And so if we have this right here, this is our basis vector right here, and then this is its complex conjugate that's put into row form there. We do the outer product, and it gives us this matrix right here. So more concretely, if we look at spin, we can get the density matrix rho for a spin half particle in the pure z up direction. So spin equal plus one, so z up by using the spin up basis vector. So this is the uh, ket right here, and this is the bra, which is the row, and it would be the complex conjugate, but there's no imaginary part in these. Uh, then we perform the outer product to obtain the operator of the pure state in the z up direction. And so that looks like this. This is our matrix right here. And we can see that this is a projection operator. Uh, and so if we just take the trace of it, the trace is going to be 1, and the trace of it squared is also going to be 1. So the expectation value for it here, 
So we take the trace of our row, which is the uh, matrix we just made right here, and then this sigma z, which is the poly matrix for spin in the z direction. And so we multiply those together. We do matrix multiplication to get this. We take the trace of it and we get one here, meaning that there is a 100% chance of finding the particle as spin up in the z direction when the particle is prepared as spin up in the z direction. So the density for a pure state uh, that uh, is either up or down, and we're doing this here in the x basis. Uh, we again, we take the outer product here to get our our matrix. And so when we calculate that out, we get this right here. So again, this is a projection operator since as we can see the trace of it, which is just adding up the things in the uh, in the diagonal. So we have this half out here. So it's half plus a half that equals one. We also see that if we do the trace of it squared, that that will also be equal to one because this one fourth gets squared, or one half gets squared to one fourth, this two and this two, so it's still half plus half. Uh, when not in the pure state, we actually get a matrix that looks like this, which again, we get the trace of it equal to one, but now the trace of the square is equal to one half. Uh, and the expectation value is zero. Where this expectation value makes sense because half the time we'll get plus one, the other half will get minus one. And so the average is this right here. So that's just a little background on what the density matrix actually is. So to continue with this Merman and Shack paper here, uh, again, use it, they're using U instead of Rho, but they're still talking about the density matrix here. So von Neumann asks whether the dispersion of any ensemble characterized by a wave function phi could result from the fact that such pure states are not the fundamental states, but only statistical mixtures of several more basic states. So again, that that ensemble that I showed above where half of them are pointed right and half are pointed left. Uh, so to specify such actual states, one would need additional data, i.e. hidden parameters, which we denote collectively by this lambda here. When it joined to the quantum state phi, these hidden parameters would determine everything, i.e. the resulting subensembles would be free of dispersion. So these would be our expectation values here. For all physical quantities R, the statistics of the non-deterministic ensemble characterized by uh, by this right here. So I must have put rho in here, but uh, they actually use u. So I'll actually change that here to u just to keep things uh, keep things consistent. With u equaling again the outer product here would result from appropriately weighted averages over all the actual states into which the phi ensemble was decomposed by hidden parameters. So again, they're just kind of describing that state where, uh, you know, sort of half of them are pointed right, half are pointed left here. Von Neumann shows, again straightforwardly, that a phi ensemble cannot be so decomposed into dispersion-free sub-ensembles provided the expectation value functions for these sub-ensembles are also of this form right here. So uh, this expectation value here using the trace of, again, I'll put this as U here and uh, our permission operator R there with the density matrix U given by this. Therefore, if the expectation value functions for quantum states can be represented by weighted averages of expectation value functions for dispersion-free sub-ensembles, then some of those sub-ensembles cannot have expectation value functions of this form right here. And, and this form right here is already, you know, something established by quantum mechanics. And so, uh, therefore, some of von Neumann's four assumptions must fail for some of those sub-ensembles. Essentially, what they mean by this is that if we have, say, the spin in z direction given in the x basis right here, then we would need if the spin 
x direction be non-dispersive. So the criticism of von Neumann's proof take the form of, object, of objecting to postulate 5 above in red or assumption B prime in green. And so Merman and Schack in this 2018 paper that I've been following here say this. It might indeed be radical to abandon for sub ensembles the idea, so this, uh, this assumption right here, that single physical quantities in simultaneously measurable sets give rise to statistics that do not depend on the particular way in which they are measured. Uh, and so this here is kind of hinting at something I'll be talking about quite a bit in the next video, which is contextuality, uh, but I will talk about that in the next video. Uh, so one could argue whether that would be more or less radical than abandoning our uh, assumptions one or two for the sub-ensembles, but why bother to argue? Why not simply give up on assumption B prime for linear combinations of physical quantities that are not simultaneously measurable? It is a peculiar feature of ordinary quantum mechanics that assumption B prime holds for the mean values over the phi ensembles specified by quantum states, even when the physical quantities cannot be jointly measured. But there is no compelling reason to expect that B prime should continue to hold for averages over the hidden variable sub ensembles into which the phi ensembles might be subdivided by specifying additional hidden variables. There is no reason at all to require that expectation value functions on possible dispersion free sub ensembles to be linear on physical quantities that are not simultaneously measurable. So again, the, you know, things that do not commute because of these, uh, you know, these uncertainty relations, uh, they're saying that there's no reason to expect that the uh, sort of linearity of the expectation value should hold for those. So maintaining the, and this is quoting here from von Neumann, so maintaining the established results of quantum mechanics only requires B prime to hold when those sub ensembles are recombined to make up the phi ensemble characterizing the full quantum state phi. This is precisely the point made by John Bell 50 years ago, 30 years before Bell by Greta Hermann. And so again, what this is saying is that there's no reason to expect this for, uh, for the non-commuting states. And so, like I said, it's, it, it, well, Bell actually even calls this a silly mistake by von Neumann for sort of not taking that into account. And so Merman, uh, this is actually in, a, in an earlier paper by just Merman here, says a particular consequence of the assumption in green uh, from the other paper that I was just talking about is that if A and B commute, then the value assigned to C equals A plus B must satisfy this, where V here is just the, uh, the function taking these operators to you know, some value. Uh, as an expression of the identity that C minus A minus B equals zero. So von Neumann's silly assumption, and uh, Merman likes to use this because, like I said, uh, John Stuart Bell famously called it a silly mistake on von Neumann's part. So Merman uh, continuously calls this silly here, so using that word. So von Neumann's silly assumption was to impose the condition three here on hidden variable theory even when A and B do not commute. But when A and B do not commute, they do not have simultaneous eigenvalues. They cannot be simultaneously measured. There are absolutely no grounds for imposing such a requirement. Von Neumann was led to it because it holds in the mean. For any state, uh, so this ket of this uppercase phi here, quantum mechanics requires whether or not A and B commute that uh, when we take sort of the uh, the inner product here with these two states on this operator that it equals the sum of the two of the two inner products right there. But to require that the function here on A plus B is equal to the function on A plus the function on B in each individual system of the ensemble is to ensure that a relation holds in the mean by imposing it case by case, a sufficient but hardly a necessary condition then he just says silly here 
again, uh, that the results of quantum mechanics are incompatible with values satisfying this condition is easy to see even in the two-dimensional state space that describes a single spin half. Uh, so we have A equals here our Pauli matrix in the X direction and B the Pauli matrix in the Y direction. The eigenvalues of the Pauli matrices are plus or minus one, so the values of the function on A and the function on B are each restricted to be plus and minus one. Thus, the only values that uh, the function on A plus the function on B can have are negative two, zero, and two. But A plus B is just the square root of two times the component of this. Uh, that's just because of you know, the fact that it'll be pointing 45 degrees in between the X and Y axis. Uh, and so it is just the uh, square root of two times the component of sigma along the direction bisecting the angle of the X and Y axes. As a result, its allowed values are plus and minus the square root of two. Therefore, a hidden variables theory of this simple system cannot satisfy three, but there is no reason to insist that it should. Uh, so again, as noted, this was actually first discovered in 1935 by uh, Greta Hermann. This is a picture of her right here. Uh, and so the first recorded objection came from the German mathematician and philosopher Greta Hermann in 1935 in her paper, and I, I don't even want to try to pronounce the German here. And I couldn't find an English translation of the paper, but there is a paraphrase of her argument in this paper, which again is linked to in the lecture notes. Uh, and this paper by Merman and Schack, going back to their 2018 paper, uh, also sort of gives what her, um, what her argument was here. And so assumption B prime from above is trivial, Hermann notes for classical physics and for quantum mechanical quantities that can be simultaneously measured because then the value, this is actually quoting from her paper here that I couldn't find an English version of, because then the value of their sum is nothing other than the sum of the values that each of them separately takes from which follows immediately the same relation for the mean values of these magnitudes. The relation is, however, not self-evident for quantum uh, mechanical quantities between which uncertainty relations hold, so things that are non-commutative. And in fact, for the reason that the sum of two such quantities is not immediately defined at all, since a sharp measurement of one of them excludes the other so that the two quantities cannot simultaneously assume sharp values, the usual definition of the sum of two quantities is not applicable. Only by the detour over certain mathematical operators assigned to these quantities does the formalism introduce the concept of a sum also for such quantities. Hermann is saying, uh, this is going back to uh, Merman and Schack here, uh, so Hermann is saying that, is saying here that because it is not clear how to define the sum of you know, the expectation value of the sum being equal to the sum of the expectation values, or an assumption B prime of the two quantities that are not jointly measurable, then quoting uh, Hermann here again, to introduce the concept of a sum for such quantities requires a detour involving mathematical operators assigned to them, i.e. von Neumann's assumptions one and two. By emphasizing the need for a detour into one and two, she underlines that it is not necessary to take B prime to define the sum of quantities that are not simultaneously measurable. And so again, it goes back to that thing that von Neumann wasn't taking these, uh, these uncertainty principles into account. And again, this seems kind of obvious to us, I think, because, but, and that's why John Stuart Bell famously called it a silly mistake on von Neumann's part. And so getting to John Stuart Bell here, so the more famous criticism comes from John Stuart Bell in his 1966 paper called On the Problem of Hidden Variables in Quantum Mechanics, which essentially has the same criticism as Hermann. Um, I, 
I think it's a little bit less clear in Bell's, but I'm going to read through sort of the important part here of his paper anyway. So at first sight, the required additivity of expectation values seems very reasonable and is rather the non-additivity of allowed values, uh, values being the eigenvalues, which requires explanation. Of course, the explanation is well known. A measurement of a sum of non-commuting observables cannot be made by combining trivially the results of separate observations on two terms. On the two terms, it requires a quite distinct experiment. For example, the measurement of spin in the x direction for a magnetic particle might be made with a suitably oriented stern Gerlach magnet. The measurement then in the y direction require a different orientation and the sum of them here a third orientation. That's kind of what I'm showing here. And this is actually sort of what uh, what Hermann was talking about or what they were talking about up here rather where the sum of these goes to the square root of 2 here where this this right here has a square root of 2 component. And so getting back to Bell here. So it requires a quite distinct experiment. For example, the measurement in the x direction for a magnetic particle might be made with a suitably oriented uh, stern Gerlach magnet. The measurement of uh, the spin in the y direction require a different orientation than the sum of them a third and different orientation. But this explanation of the non-additivity of allowed values also establishes the non-triviality of the additivity of expectation values. The latter is a quite peculiar property of quantum mechanical states, not to be expected a priori. There is no reason to demand it individually of the hypothetical dispersion free states whose function it is to reproduce the measurable peculiarities of quantum mechanics when averaged over. In the trivial example of a spin half particle, the dispersion free states specified X have additive expectation values only for commuting operators. Nevertheless, they give logically consistent and precise predictions for the results of all possible measurements which when averaged over X are fully equivalent to the quantum mechanical predictions. In fact, for the trivial example, the hidden variable question is posed informally by von Neumann and his book is answered in the affirmative. Thus the formal proof of von Neumann does not justify his informal conclusion. It is therefore not as often assumed a question of reinterpretation of quantum mechanics. The present system of quantum mechanics would have to be objectively false in order that another description of the elementary process than the, than the statistical one be possible. And so again, this is you know what von Neumann was thought he was proving here was that we couldn't have a hidden variables uh, interpretation of quantum mechanics. And that's what this uh, somewhat more verbose quote of, of von Neumann was here. It was not the objective measurable predictions of quantum mechanics which ruled out hidden variables. It was the arbitrary assumption of a particular and impossible relation between the results of incompatible measurements, either of which might be made on a given occasion, but only one of which can in fact be made. And so, Again, you know, when you measure in one, you know, in the Z direction, say you can't simultaneously measure in the X direction, which is kind of the assumption that von Neumann, the silly assumption that von Neumann seemed to make. Uh, so there's another criticism of von Neumann's proof. It's, it's pretty much similar, uh, but it's slightly different. I'm not gonna read through the whole thing here uh, I want to get to this right here, which is uh, kind of the thing I wanted to get out of this criticism. So borrowing a question from the title of a paper from Pinch, we then may ask, what does a proof do if it does not prove? Well, the answer might be that von Neumann's proof indeed did not prove that it was what it was aiming to prove, but yet it is proving something. It is proving that if hidden variables do exist, they cannot be of a quantum type, because if they were, then von Neumann's proof would apply to them. This restricts the class of admissible hidden variables theories. 
but it does not rule them out. The restriction of the class of admissible hidden variables theories, as we shall see, will require other conditions. They will have to be contextualist and non-local, as is the case for early Bohm's pilot wave. And in fact, in a couple of videos here, when I start talking about the pilot wave theory, uh, you know, that's actually why I'm doing this video and then the next video on the Koken Specker theorem is to get at this idea of contextualist and non local here, which is what the pilot wave theory does. And we'll actually, I'll actually show uh, in the videos that I make on the pilot wave theory how it actually accounts for this contextuality and non locality. Uh, I think there's probably, and I don't want to get into this too much here, but I think the pilot wave theory is often thought of as being local by people who haven't read that much into it. I mean, at least when I first heard about it, I thought that it would probably be local as well, but it is actually a non-local theory, uh, and it is contextualist. And so that's what this paper is saying, is that, uh, that von Neumann's proof is showing that you need contextuality and that's actually what the Koken Specker theorem that I'll talk about in the next video proves is that uh, that a theory of quantum mechanics needs to be contextualist, which essentially just means that it matters in what way you are actually measuring some value. I mean, you know, that is, is kind of, it's almost more of a a different way of talking about the uncertainty principles. You know, when you're measuring in the Z direction, you get information about the spin in the Z direction. But if you do it in the X direction, your your experiment is in a different context. And so you're going to get different information about it. But I'll go into more detail about contextuality in the next video. All right, so the main takeaway from all this is that von Neumann's proof fails because he was assuming that expectation value functions on possible dispersion-free sub-ensembles were linear on physical quantities that are not simultaneously measurable, or in other words, not commuting. But in fact, quantum mechanics only requires this to be true when commuting sub-ensembles can be recombined to make a full quantum state. Or to put it even more succinctly, Von Neumann did not take the uncertainty relations into account when coming up with his postulates or assumptions here. And so, like I said, th this seems like a you know kind of you know a v an obvious oversight is why Bell famously called it a silly mistake. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, these are the resources used down here. But anyway, that was what I wanted to talk about in this video. So this, uh, so von Neumann's impossibility proof here was kind of a first shot at showing that hidden variables would be impossible. And it seemed like for a lot of people for quite a long time, they sort of took von Neumann's proof as kind of gospel. In fact, a lot of these papers that I reference here sort of talk about, you know, how von Neumann's proof was often sort of lauded as this thing that showed that, you know, Einstein and Schrodinger and these people who wanted a hidden variables theory had to be wrong. Uh, and, you know, like the Greta, uh, the stuff with from Greta Hermann was uh, ignored for most of history. It wasn't until quite a bit later that it was rediscovered. In fact, I think it was after Bell sort of came up with the same criticism as her in 66 that it was, so it was after that, I think, even that uh, Greta Hermann's um, criticism was sort of rediscovered. But yeah, so it, it's one of those kind of weird things where uh, von Neumann thought he made this proof and then everybody was like, well, von Neumann is, you know, a genius. And he was, you know, let's, which is why his mistake was quite silly. Uh, so everybody thought, well, von Neumann's a genius, and he just proved that hidden variables theories are impossible. So we'll just not even look into, you know, what his proof was and just believe him that, uh, that his, that hidden variables theories are impossible. But as we saw in this video, that von Neumann's proof does not prove that hidden variables theories are impossible. It only proves 
uh, what that last quote was saying essentially that uh, that it it proves that uh, it has to be contextuous that a a hidden variables theory would have to be contextualist and non-local uh, and Bell's inequality is sometimes uh, lauded even nowadays as being a something that proves that hidden variable theories cannot happen but what it actually shows is only that it has to be non-local uh, and we'll get into Bell's inequality more in future videos as well but uh, so just so I don't drone on too long uh, I hope you found this video helpful and I will see you in the next one